Well, good morning, everyone. As you can see behind me, it is not morning when I'm recording this, but you should be watching this on Sunday morning. So uh, if you are joining us on YouTube, this is your virtual uh, message for the week of February the 21st. Um, if you are joining us live on uh, on Facebook, it will be a very similar message to this, but we might go in depth a little bit more. So. With that being said, let me welcome you. It's good to have you here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is James. I'm the lead pastor here at Calvary Chapel. It is absolutely wonderful to have you with us. And this week is actually the beginning of Lent. So we thought, what a better thing to talk about than fasting. It's a, it's a good time to remember uh, what fasting is, why we should do it, and also, and maybe even more importantly, why we shouldn't do it. So let's dive right in. This is going to be a little bit of a shorter message. Um, and we're, as I said, we're probably going to pull this out a little bit more on Sunday morning in our Facebook Live as well as our in-person um, service. Which reminds me, if you want to attend an in-person service at Calvary Chapel, uh, please make sure you get in touch with me either through YouTube, or sorry, not YouTube, what am I talking about? Either through my email or send me a text or give me a phone call. So that's james.calvarynipawa at gmail.com or you can uh, call or text my cell phone at 431-351-0497. And all that information will be in the description of this video uh, should you want to attend in person. Make sure you get in touch. So this morning's scripture, we are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6, uh, specifically verses 16 to 18, and that will come up on the screen here for your reference as soon as we start reading it. So that's kind of where we're going to be starting today, and let's just go ahead and get right into the message. So... Suppose that I was to make you some tea. Okay, everyone loves tea. Um, I have hot water and I have a tea bag. In order to make the tea, I have to dip the bag in the water, right? Now, what would happen if I were to just plunge the bag in once or twice? Um, it wouldn't make for very good tea, okay? My wife would say that that tea is, is pretty weak and it needs a little bit more body, needs some more strength to it. Now, if instead I continually submerge the tea bag into water, the flavor of that tea will grow much stronger. The, strong, uh, the, the longer that the tea leaves remain immersed in the water, the more water gets into the tea, and the more the tea is released into the water. This is the way it is also with our spiritual life. The more that we are dipped into the spiritual, the more we are dipped into the things of God, the more the things of God or the spiritual life is developed in us and the more we are releasing into the world around us. Spiritual disciplines are like the act of dipping the tea into the water. The more we practice the various disciplines, the stronger we grow spiritually. The disciplines make, make a way for Christ to be formed in us. You see, when the water flows over the tea, the tea is now immersed into the life of that water and it has no identity of its own. The two, in a very real way, merge and become something completely different. In the same way, we are purchased by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So our life is not our own. Now, there's a, a well-known author in the Christian sphere named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm sure some of you have read, uh, read his works. We've actually got some in our church library if you want to check them out. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship, uh, he observed, uh, and this is a direct quote from him, he observed, we have to practice, practice strictest daily discipline, so only then can the flesh learn the painful lesson that it has no rights of its own. Richard Foster, another well-known author um, of a more modern, uh, modern book <clears throat> uh, titled The Celebration of Discipline, he identifies 12 disciplines which he calls the door to liberation. And this is all kind of fancy words, but he's identified four inward disciplines which he calls meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. There are four outward disciplines, simplicity, solitude, submission, and service, and four corporate disciplines, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Now, maybe you agree or disagree with some of those, uh, some of those disciplines, and that's okay, because this week we're only talking about 
fasting. Specifically, I want to explain three reasons not to fast, and I'm going to give you six reasons why we should fast. So, right off the outset, let's be careful not to conclude that I'm saying that fasting is not a valid practice. I am going to give you three reasons why we probably shouldn't fast, but I am not saying that fasting is not valid today. Uh, there are many who would say that, uh, that that's true. Um, I believe that if you take an unbiased look at scripture, we would be led to believe that fasting is not only valid today, but it's also important. Uh, that being said, we can find, let's start at the beginning, we'll start with the three reasons not to, and we can find those in the Bible. So let's turn in our Bibles. I've got mine right here. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. When you fast, notice that, uh, that it does not say if you fast, or if you decide to, or if you feel like fasting. When you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, what that piece of scripture is saying is when you fast, when you go about fasting, don't make a big show of it. Um, you know, don't don't show others how distressed you are, but instead, you know, take care of yourself. Wash your face. Make sure you're, you're, you're looking good and you're ready to, to go. Fasting is, is something done between you and God, right? So here, in what I just read, Jesus gives us our first and most important reason not to fast. And I already talked about that a little bit. Do not fast if you're doing it to be noticed by people. Jesus said that those who look somber and try to make others feel sorry for them because they're fasting are just hypocrites. They say that this is how they'll get their reward. If you do something for the applause of other people, when you get that applause, that's the only reward you're going to get. Now, John Piper, another author, he wrote in A Hunger for God. This is what he says about, uh, about fasting. And I'm going to forewarn anybody watching. There's, he uses some very prickly language in here. If the reward you aim at in fasting is the admiration of others, that is what you will get. And that will be all you get. In other words, the danger of hypocrisy is that it is so successful. It aims at the praise of men and it succeeds. But that's all. Our reward should be the knowledge of God, not the praise of men, right? That's what we're doing it for. If you want the praise of other people, go ahead and fast and point out to everyone how hungry you are and how greatly you suffer for Jesus. But the reality is, you and I both know it, you're not really doing it for Jesus. And Jesus knows that. He will not honor your appearance of godliness for the knowledge of him. People might praise you, but you won't find the Father. You won't find God in your fasting. Now, this is kind of the lens that you're looking through. Like, man, if I'm going to give up three meals a day, the last thing that I want to do is settle for the applause of other people. Give me Jesus. If I can't have him, well, you know what? I'm going to go over to Boston Pizza. And I'm just going to have some lunch there. Because if I can't find God in my fasting, there's no point in fasting to begin with. Now, I think it's important to point out, though, that Jesus did not say that your fast is invalid if others find out. He's talking about your motive of fasting. See, it's funny to me that some people have turned this teaching of fasting into some superstition that's on par with making a birthday wish, right? You know how that goes. When you know, they bring the cake out, they would say, oh, make a wish, but oh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone or it won't come true. So, you know, when you when you make the wish, you blow out the candles. As long as you don't tell anyone, your wish comes true. Now, listen, don't fast so that others will know. Do what you can to keep it between just you and God, right? But if others find out about it, your motive is not any less pure. Now, people finding out that you're fasting does not nullify or uh, nullify the sanctity of your fast. It doesn't make your fast any less important. 
but fasting so that others will be impressed, it does mean that there was probably no sanctity in your fast in the first place. Now, by the way, the, the birthday wish superstition points out reason number two not to fast. You should not fast because you want your wish to come true. There is plenty of teaching out there that suggests that a person can, ca can fast for a few days and get whatever they want from their deep-pocketed God. Uh, this kind of goes back to the idea of, of prosperity gospel in a way, right? If you fast for a few days and ask for a boat, they say God will provide. Fast for a few days and you'll receive money to cover your debts. Fast for a few days and uh, God will give you the job you want. Now, I can't find this in scripture. Okay, I, I've, I've, I have read this book cover to cover many times. And I have not found anywhere in scripture where that is accurate. Now, fasting does get us ready to know God's will and pray accordingly. But it will never be the means to manipulate God into conforming to our will. Right? We pray, your will be done. Not ours, your will. If you fast as though you're blowing out the candles, hoping your wish will come true, the end result is you will soon be disappointed in God and you will be disillusioned with the idea of fasting because you didn't approach it with the proper motivation in the first place. Now, reason number three, third and final reason not to fast is if you don't understand fasting. Um, now, this is a story that... that um, that I read about uh, a man was talking about his daughter and, and her first experience with fast, with fasting. So um, I'm going to read it in first person. Obviously, I don't have a daughter named Hannah, but this is the story of, of, of a man and his, uh, he, and he's talking about his daughter, Hannah. So that, this is the story um, about what happens when you fast, when you don't understand fasting. My daughter, Hannah, had never fasted before and opted to start with a 40-day fast from sweets during Lent the period between Ash Wednesday and Easter, this period right now that we're in. Her motivation may have been to impress me. It may have been for better health, but I'm convinced it was also out of a desire to be a devoted follower of Christ. I don't think, however, that it came out of an understanding of the fast. So as she was at, offered candy at school or tempted by snacks at home, it became a religious burden to her. My counsel was that she should end her fast and do so without any sense of shame or condemnation. I'm confident God was pleased at her desire to please him and will teach her to fast in time. So you see, when you go about fasting without proper knowledge, as what happened to young Hannah, when you don't understand the full, the full motivation or understand what a fast actually entails, it can seem burdensome. It can seem like a religious burden. See, remember... We are all included in Christ by faith, not by works. Fasting doesn't buy God's love. He already loves us. We, as Christ followers, are called to believe, not to impress upon others the depth of our belief. We don't compete with one another. We don't compare ourselves to one another. I mean, at least we're not supposed to. There are several disciplines that allow us to enter into this inner chamber with God, and fasting is one of those opportunities that I believe that God wants us to employ. But the worst thing you can do is try to practice it out of some sense of obligation to the church without really understanding what it means. See, you may only need a little understanding to enter in, and once you do, God will work and he will, he will lead you along. Holy Spirit will do, do his, his job as teacher. As you go into fasting... With even a little understanding, it will become more clear as you go through. But do it based on the understanding that you have and never fast reluctantly or because you're being, you, you're under compulsion to do so. Now, I'm trying to make it perfectly clear that no person should fast because they feel obligated to fast. Even if we're calling for a corporate fast amongst our congregation, and especially if fasting is new to you or you don't understand it, okay? So now that I've given you the reasons not to fast, let me give you six reasons why you should fast, okay? These are, these are the, the reasons why uh, fasting is important and what fasting will actually do in our life. And I just realized that maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, what is fasting? Well, fasting is when you, 
you know, scripturally, fasting is when you would go without food for a period of time with the sole intent of becoming closer to God, having a greater revelation of God, or um, as we're going to see here, there, there's some other reasons why fasting is important. But basically, fasting is when you intentionally decide to go without food for a certain period of time, okay? Now, if you're practicing Lent, which, you know, some denominations do, if you are practicing Lent, please don't try to give up food for 40 days. That is not healthy. You'll probably end up in the hospital, okay? Um, but uh, consult your pastor for, for more guidance there. Six reasons why you should fast. Reason number one, fasting is feasting on God. Jesus said that if you fast without the motive to impress others, your fasting in secret will be rewarded in secret by the Father. In the secret place, God is there. Your Father in heaven is your reward. And this is the great overarching purpose in all of our fasting. It means It's a means through which we draw near to God and he rewards us with the knowledge of his presence. Dallas Willard and Richard Foster agree that fasting is feasting. I'm not the one who made this up, right? Guys much smarter than me figured this out. Fasting is feasting. It's not suffering for suffering's sake. It's passing up the appetizers for the main course. It's always an opportunity to know God and know his will. In that sense, it's far more satisfying than anything you've given up for the sake of knowing him. Only those who fast will really know that to be true. So many of us just keep on eating the appetizers and salads and say they're good enough. It's like if you have a peripheral relationship with with God. I mean, maybe you've read the Bible and you attend church, but you're lacking that personal relationship. That's like settling for appetizers when you could be having a big steak in front of you. Now, it's, it's common for those who haven't fasted to look at it and say, well, the price is too high. I can't go without food. I have to have my breakfast in the morning, at least to Tim Hortons. We spend a lot of time fasting from God and feasting on food and life's other pleasures. Fasting is an intentional way of saying, God, you mean more to me than any of these earthly things, even the good things like the food that you've given us. Fasting is feasting. And if you feast, or (laughs) I've said this word too many times, if you fast for no other reason, or any of these five remaining reasons, you will find that to be true. That if you fast with the intent of feasting on God, he will satisfy. Reason number two why you should fast. If you are giving yourself to prayer over an urgent matter. Okay. Now, most examples of fasting in the Bible occur in the face of great danger. When the armies of Moab and Ammon were, were bearing down on Judah, King Jehoshaphat resolved to, uh, these are, this is the quotation, he resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. When Queen Esther was made aware of, of Haman's plot to kill the Jews, she instructed Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. There are times when we realize the only hope we have is the Lord's favor. And in those times when you and I need to inquire of the Lord, Fasting is the one way to tune our attention to God, expressing our our desperation for him above all other things and making us still to hear his reply in his swift, sure hand. Your food is to do the will of the Father. Okay, this is reason number three. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. A period of fasting can be an example of expressing to the Father that you are joined with Christ in completing his mission. One of the questions asked uh, asked of me that I, or rather that I have had asked, is what percentage of your, of your congregation takes personal responsibility for the battle cry of the gospel? Um, I couldn't honestly answer that question, and the reason why is because of the two is because of the statements personal responsibility and battle cry of the gospel. Now, if they had asked me what percentage of my congregation believed in the gospel, uh, and that gospel is the power of God for salvation, I could answer well quite high. But my experience has been that most people are quick to declare the the gospel, but slow to take personal responsibility for it. People have seemed to be much more ready to claim personal responsibility for the style of music the church has, or making sure the money is spent wisely. 
I've seen people go into battle over these things, fight tooth and nail to get their way. But there are fewer people who consider the urgency of the gospel a battle cry. Our God is far too often our stomachs, and the filling of our appetite is far too high of a priority much of the time. Fasting is a means to declare that the thing that sustains us most is doing the will of the Father and joining with him to give hope to our world. You want to express sorrow for sin. This is another reason why you should um, you should fast. When Jonah finally got around to preaching in Nineveh, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And sackcloth is a rough, coarse cloth or bag-like garment that was worn as a symbol of repentance. When Nineveh heard the message of the coming judgment, they did a quick moral inventory and realized that they were about to get what they had coming. They began to mourn over their sin and cover themselves in hopes of finding mercy. Now listen to the decree of king uh, of the king from Jonah 3, 7 to 10. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from us his fierce anger so we will not perish. When God saw what they did and he saw how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. Fasting can be for us a means of wearing the sackcloth. It's a way to enter into mourning over the sin that separates us from God and require the Father to send the Son to the cross on our behalf. When you, fa you are fasting, you will be amazed at how aware of, uh, of yourself you become. The fast then provides a great opportunity for repentance, putting off the old self and putting on the new. A view of God's mercy calls us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Um, you, maybe you want to express a desire to share in Christ's sufferings. Jesus said a, a strange thing recorded for us in John chapter 6, verse 51. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Eating the bread that is the flesh of Jesus sounds quite cannibalistic, perhaps. Uh, but Jesus is not speaking literally. Obviously, he's speaking figuratively. He is in the flesh, the bread that nourishes. If he had not come in the flesh, we would not have life. But he gave that flesh for the world. When we fast, instead of eating physical food, we are choosing to eat the bread of Jesus' flesh, which is to unite ourselves with his suffering for the world. It's our way of saying with Paul, I want to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. We share in the ministry of Christ's sufferings when we suffer with him to heighten our awareness of world hunger and other concerns that flow from man's fallen conditions. Here's another, here's another one. I think this is the, the last one on our list. Number six, you want to express a desire for Christ to come back. The passage of scripture most commonly used to teach that fasting is not proper for today is found in Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Um, Matthew 9, 14, 15 uh, says, Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Many argue that since Jesus raised from the dead um, and has sent his spirit to man, we no longer need to fast. But Jesus also said he was going away to prepare a place for us, and he would send the spirit to be our counselor and our guide to the truth. He also told parables about being ready for the return of the bridegroom. We are in an age right now where we are waiting um, expectantly for Christ's return. We are the bride of Christ and we are expectantly awaiting his return. Fasting is one way to keep our oil lamps uh, burning as we watch for his return. So my challenge for you this week is to go from here prepared to be made new in the attitude of your mind. If you ever thought that fasting was too high a price, maybe consider it again. What may be open to you is an entire new arena through which your life may be immersed in Christ. Do you want to feast on the Father? First, we must gain control of, the, of our other appetites so we can really know him. 
Well, thank you for joining me this morning, folks. I hope that you've enjoyed this message. I hope that it has uh, taught you a little bit about fasting and why we should and shouldn't fast. And as I've already said, I'm running out of breath here. As I've already said, if you want to attend one of our in-person services, please remember to email me, send me a text, give me a phone call, call our office, uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, go ahead and reserve a seat. Services are at 10.30 a.m. Uh, I can assure you that everything is being cleaned and disinfected and we are following public health uh, guidance and advice. So if that interests you, get in touch. Um, and yeah, we will see you here next week uh, for our for our next message. Um, look forward to seeing you then. Until then, have a great week.